Uh, I'm truly uh, humbled and inspired to be here this afternoon. I'm Richard. Uh, just a bit of context, uh, this is where I've been for the last 20 years. Uh, the last 10 I've spent in Asia, seven of which was in Shanghai. Um, and the last piece on the right is the logo of a 110-year-old Hong Kong family business, which no one's almost ever heard of, which I'm very happy about. So click. The Fun Group is the company I work for now. Um, on one side of it is we're Asian retailers. We own Toys R Us, we own Gives and Hawks, Sonia Retail, and a bunch of other global brands sold into China as true retailers. And on the left, we have a supply chain orchestrating business, so we're design, production, sourcing, logistics for probably half the clothes that you're wearing at this point without you knowing about it. And in the middle is a global brands group in New York. So my job is essentially, as a bunch of entrepreneurs in the business, is to rebuild this culture of innovation for it. What does that actually mean? So when uh, Linda asked me to come talk about marketplaces, I was actually happy, because most of the time we were always talking about retailing. And I actually think retailing is kind of dead. So I wanted to put out a hypothesis, so I'm actually looking for a little uh, permission to fail this afternoon. So if I'm wrong, you can tell me afterwards. So I had this idea that for the last 10 years or so, I've been in Asia uh, and China. And what I'm realizing, whilst everyone else is fixated on Amazon and Facebook and everything else, there's a billion consumers in Asia and India and South America and other places. And that's probably where the future of retailing is actually uh, coming about, and I think marketplace is, a, is, a, is the right language. So we live in exponential times. Everybody talks about it, it's fine. But leading as a, either as a global company or as, as uh, Henry does with Glossier, leadership feels more, much more like whitewater rafting. It's constant uh, ebbing and flowing of what's going on around you and making the right decisions. It feels much more like this. And as far as innovation goes, at the, all of the frameworks go away, but for me this is the one simple one where companies are constantly in the mode between what they're really good at is the thing on, the, on your right, which is they sit in a room around a bunch of PowerPoint and politics, they make some decisions, make some choices, and they converge on some ideas. What companies and governments and essentially markets and categories are not so great at is the left-hand side. What kinds of diverging behaviors, what kinds of new choices uh, are, are being made, are being sought? And that's really because to get new choices, you have to have new questions. So if you think about the usual adage, if you ask a fisherman what he wants for dinner, he never says pork chops, he always says fish, right? So if you ask a retailer or a brand or a mall owner or anyone in real estate, what's the future of retailing? They'll just go, more sales, more consumption, that's what we want. Because the context that everybody's been in, essentially for the last 30 years, that most of the retail in the West has been surfing the globalization of production. Um, and that is basically what we, uh, has been happening. A pair of Levi's is pretty much the same price it was 15 years ago. And yet, and what actually happens then is you end up with this old model, right? Some designer somewhere sends the idea to a factory, it gets shoved down the pipe, and eventually ends up with consumers. And this old sort of push model has what has been happening. And that's why if you really look around the world at retailing, there's just a massive oversupply of... of um, of inventory sitting on people's books. And so for the last 10 years, maybe seven to 10 years, really what has been going on is this emerging of, you know, two thirds of the world's population doesn't live in the West, it actually lives in other places. And that globalization of one billion consumers entering the middle class marketplace is really fundamentally changing how the dynamics are working. And so I don't know whether this is the right model, but it's, it's a way of explaining it, which is it's less about push and it will end up being more about pull. And when you end up with pull, you end up with a series of different dynamics. And as I, I would say, which is, if a billion consumers are on the right, they are, like, you, you know, cross-border e-commerce, you can buy things all the way across the world. And when you're buying them, they're buying them on your phone or in a store, it doesn't matter. And the goods are produced mainly in the East at the moment, but essentially that digitization and robotics is happening in, in the factories, and all the way through to the end where you could have mass customization happening. So you've constantly got this ebb and flow now that goes up and down the supply chains, confusing what used to be a simple model. So then we said, okay, so what is this couple of questions that we want to ask? So what I want to show you to start with is, very quickly if I can, is the future of stuff. So Henry's right. Um, the future of products themselves is changing and the production method is also changing. And we got into this a few years ago when we started looking at 3D printing. 
as this sort of place to start thinking about what the world looked like. And as I said, we run or well, own Toys R Us in Asia, and when this inflatable yellow duck appeared in Hong Kong's harbour, it gave us this instant opportunity to go, go, okay, so can you take production of retailing and jam together? So I'm going to show you a very quick video. In early 2013, the Fun Group formed a team to research into 3D printing and how it could actually help the next generation of consumers and what it would mean for the future of retail and sourcing. Because we were testing the experiment of hyper-local promotional items, uh, we looked into kind of iconic Hong Kong items. We started with the dim sum basket, a rickshaw, a junk boat, and ultimately the Hong Kong skyline. And we decided to go with the dim sum basket because it's simple, much like the rubber duck. Where we're just about to launch the uh, 3D duck party event, uh, and so hopefully over the next four days uh, we get some real excitement in store. <laughs> We were selling this $38 Hong Kong dollars yesterday. Uh, we found out that from the consumer saying uh, this is kind of not very functional. We quickly overnight designed new back support. So uh, now this is actually a big hit. So the reason we've shown that again is the nature of the production is actually very different now. And so again, that's not, it's happening all across the world. We're also doing a bunch of work in the kind of consumer uh, IoT space, none of which I can talk about but at this point. But ultimately, we're living in a world where, if you imagine, we make about four billion things a year for our customers. And of those four billion things, at some point, those will be connected to the internet the same way that supposedly the Samsung fridge was. So as your clothes or your footwear or your accessories start connecting to the web, the role of the product itself also changes. So you end up in a reflective mode and like the, the, the obvious answer here is that the nature of stuff and the making of it is actually changing. That, that's kind of obvious, but when you think about in terms of retailing, you're, you're changing the, again all of the rules of, of the game because everything's going to change. So if all things are being digitized, then all things are essentially products, and the products can become services, and services become fluid. So as you think about the music industry and the media industry, that has already happened, but it has not happened so far with the stuff that surrounds us, but it will. So all the rules are changing. And one of the, the things that we see is that the, there'll be a less of a focus on the, content, on the content itself, the thing, and much more interesting around the context, its use, its meaning. Why does somebody use it anymore? So if your clothes are connected to the internet, it will also change. The next thing is we talk about, especially in retailing, is it gives retailers, and Henry just talked about it, right? Like, everybody's just fixated on transaction, but actually gives people, gives retailers, it gives uh, brands a verb beyond selling. So what, what is servicing is? No one's really figured that out, but if you need to replace your shirt or replace pieces of your clothing and stuff, then you end up with this much longer life cycle of products. So then, if you get onto the core of really what retailing is, when did it really, I, I, this is where the hypothesis kicks in. I don't think it's about retailing. For me, it's about marketplaces and consumption. And so if you remember this backwards and forwards ebb and flow of, uh, of, of retail supply channels as it is, then you could basically say maybe the word is marketplacing, because I'm not really sure what the word, because we don't have a word for it at the moment, but this idea that people are moving up and down the supply chain. And if I thought about marketplaces, I, I, has anyone read this book? I'd hope so. so this is the Clue Train Manifesto, which came out at least 10 years ago, when it was really a discussion around the future of the internet. And it, its premise was essentially markets are conversations. So if markets are conversations, then I go to this place of like, okay, so where do you get consumers and conversations together so we can actually look at what consumption looks like? And in general, as I said before, if you were looking at the future of retailing, you would go to where new young money is, and that would be in South America or in Moscow or in China or in India. And so global looks really different when you come to Asia, right? And so I actually have a question. Has anyone seen, hands up, I have a quick show of hands. Who's seen this New York Times film on the internet? Nobody. Oh, one or two, okay. As Henry said, if you want to do anything, it's a three to four minute video it will change what you believe about China. Just watch it whenever you leave here. It's pr pretty awesome, okay? So, to that point, what it puts out is either one equals three or 996, as Ray talked about yesterday, that one week in China is essentially three weeks anywhere else. 
It's an accelerated culture place. There's a lot of stuff going on all the time. And whether it's mobile and cashless consumers, the, uh, the amount of mobile transactions in China are 50 times what they are in the US last year. It's just, and that, that is therefore fueling a bunch of other things, like the sharing economy, which started uh, maybe like three, four years ago, and is now like between three to 4% of GDP in China. So whether it's umbrellas or whether it's bikes, everyone's trying to figure out what this looks like. Um, and again, yeah, it's not about cash flow and revenue, it's all about data at the moment. It's also enabled what we would call Wang Hong or uh, web celebrities to appear. So the whole idea of live streaming has enabled these key opinion leaders or KOLs to sort of exist in China and to begin to challenge global brands and local brands. And so of the top 10 stores that are on Taobao, uh, half of the brands are actually young women like this that are the key opinion leaders and have a whole bunch of back end behind them that looks more like this. So there's a digital co sort of cottage industry happening. And so who have minimum order quantities of less than 30. So they're making small amounts, small units of things really, really fit fast in days versus weeks or months, which is really what happens. And these are not old fashioned factories. These are small, super connected data enriched Uberization of, of factories. It's actually already happening. So then the question we always ask ourselves is, OK, if we exist in this world, how do we learn faster? So we decided we, you know, we would build what the future looks like, and we built this retail lab in Shanghai, which we called Explorium, about 18 months ago. It was for us a place people would tell us about the future retailing all the time. We said, OK, well, let's go build things instead of talking about them. So one, it was data analytics hub. Two, it was sort of interactive uh, exhibition space. We focused on kids and families. But really what it was was a sort of back of the house research and learning lab for us. We live in exponential times. Retail in China is changing faster than ever before. Exploring allows consumers to be part of the debate, to be part of the experiment, and to influence what's going to happen in the future. One thing that we can do here that we can't do in a lot of places around the world is we can actually figure out what people are doing physically at the same time they're doing something digitally. IBM provide the back-end analytics for Explorium. They help us identify and understand exactly what people are doing, almost what they're thinking. So what we do is everyone has a tag on their wrist, so we're able to see how long do people stay in certain areas of the Explorium, kind of making a decision as to what's exciting to them or not. I can actually see what they're looking at online on the Explorium app, and then do they actually go and look at that merchandise or not. So I can do a correlation between the two and decide where they are and what they're looking at. So the data we collect in real time, and this allows us to understand immediately what's happening, what the customer responses are to brands and their technologies. And we're therefore able to adapt and to iterate our experiments to respond immediately. So this is really about understanding what does the future of retail look like? What do consumers want? How should brands respond accordingly? The most... Uh, click on, it'll go on. So uh, as we said, we would get pitched to all these ideas about what the future of retailing was about, and ultimately the idea was really just to go build what we thought we were doing with our customers and with our partners. And so if you remember this diagram I showed you earlier, you still you have these marketplaces up and down the supply chain. But really what's in and around, among those are, are, are thousands or millions of people in China figuring out how to work with this. And when you look at that, there are also then three platforms. Everybody talks about Alibaba, but ultimately since, since uh, marketplace is much more social. Actually, Tencent that has WeChat is probably going to win out at this point. And then Baidu's the third one. So, so essentially, you have these massive platforms who are all the size of Amazon already, or if not bigger, already supporting this multi multitude of different ways of, of consumers to engage with the products around them. And so you have conversations at scale and at lightning speed happening in China currently already. So that's why Amy said earlier, to a certain degree, the, the future of retailing and marketplaces is already existing in China. I, what I'm really saying is it's just as interesting to go there as it is to look anywhere else, but there are, that, that's really where I would start. So then there's always this place of there's a marketplace for that. So there's, there's literally, uh, uh, almost on a daily basis, new things opening and closing down. It's pretty a, a remarkable thing to watch. And so it's really hard to keep abreast of really what's going on. 
Because what's fueling it is this willingness to try. So education is a huge thing in China, and so everyone just wants to try things out. And the, and the barriers to entry are super low. So in general, people are trying stuff out all the time. And so in the education market, what you could say is either the market by itself or the knowledge market or learning is really enabling, is, is uh, fueling this willingness to try. And so in the education market itself, there's, this, uh, there's a marketplace called Ask Me. So you can ask the app, you have the app and you ask a question and it goes out to either a bunch of famous people and they can answer it or you can, or like a bunch of experts can answer. And then anyone can read what those answers are and if you want to go further, you end up paying for it. So it ends up in this different way where answers and knowledge are being exchanged, sometimes with or without money. And so you end up in this interesting place where the Oxford English Dictionary says consumers are just uh, people that buy stuff. I think that's a pretty limited view of the world. And so what you're ending up seeing now much more in China is this notion of agency, where consumers are both buyers but also sellers and exchangers of, our, of their ideas and part of it, and in China at scale. And so this I th think about... This uh, app called Dada ABC. It's an English um, teaching... Oh, hold, on. hold on. So this is... With <laughs> Otherwise, it'll go really quickly. This, so if you take education, uh, as a marketplace. This is a friend of mine, Wendy, whose son uh, is doing English lessons. So you'll see it, it moves really quickly, but I'll, I'll explain it afterwards. Uh, app called Dada ABC. It's an English um, teaching platform, and my son can communicate with with a native speaker on the platform every week. And uh, and then I take photo of my son using the app. I will share on my WeChat. And then if somebody clicked into it and uh, and buy the same courses, I can get some extra courses. Right. So what she's essentially saying is she's buying uh, um, lessons for her son off the app, which is already buried two levels down in WeChat. And then as she's doing this, she's sharing those and, and the results with her friends or with other people on the platform. And then that, those, those friends are either going to sign up to the same thing and then she gets a discount. So there's this constant movement between value exchange, uh, some of which is money and some of which isn't. But there's this idea that you can at one point buy things and then move things around. And so it's come up with this idea of social plus. And so again, in China, as a bit like Henry was talking about earlier, the short, there's social media everywhere. But really what's happening is the, because of these multiple layers and these super apps like WeChat, it's enabling all these multi-levels of exchange to happen. And so even as an example, this is... Uh, Topot, which is a, I talked about key opinion ladies earlier. So this is a incubator for web celebrities. So this is a company who promote and find young, awesome people to better sell their own, create their own brands on the web. And there's a marketplace for this. And there's at least 10 or 15 of these already. So again, it's sort of, it's raising this idea of in China where there is no privacy anyway, pretty much. Uh, and people, <laughs> it's funny, Chinese people always get like freaked out. It was like, why do Western people get so worried about privacy? Because to China, everybody already trusts, inverted commas, what the government does. But actually giving your data to, to a company is weird to them. And so in, a, in this way, that's why, again, like the, the different levels of value exchange, the idea around convenience and giving, giving away your data in order to get some convenience is actually pretty standard. Um, and so often there is this, as I said, between whether it's the education thing, this idea of creating different value exchanges, which is beyond money, is actually happening. And that's really what the, the most interesting thing for us is. And of course, you still end up with uh, you know, China's version of LA Beast, right? Which this is the Pangeo brothers. Uh, they get about 4 million hits every time they do some crazy eating stunt on, on the web. Um, and again, you can't see it here, and I'll, sh I'll show you. This is a little lady eater kitten. All of the things that you can see that are popping up are essentially small emoticons that people are buying and then sending to her. She will then monetize or use later. So is this, and she makes about 4,000 US a month just selling, just basically eating online. Slightly dark, but whatever. So then, okay, so it's, it's about money, but it's, it's beyond money, but it's about money. And what that does is that that is fueling this multiple layers of different value exchanges, whether it's B2B all the way down to peer-to-peer -peer and, uh, and consumer-to-consumer -consumer selling. There's even, a web, there's even a marketplace of marketplaces, right? There's this like five, Wupao is, is a marketplace that sells other people's marketplaces. 
So as far as the reflector goes, there's this constant flow that we have between are we experimenting and are we optimizing? We're often in the mode of what's the book of unlearning, because most of this is about constantly figuring out how not to do things that we didn't do before. And then we're always in this mode of organizational curiosity. And so I'm going to really quickly, if I can, there's one small video I want to show. So in this mode of at the end of the lab year last year, um, in order for us to think about, OK, what does the, the organizational being look like, we, we sort of wanted a ver version of ourselves. So how do we find the next version of ourselves? So I thought, OK, we're doing this sort of what we think is interesting work. If I invite 20 friends, will they invite 20 other friends? And actually, that's what happened. So we, we ran this small uh, hack. We called it Hack the Future. Small workshop where we invited a bunch of crazy people that were doing things around anonymity and privacy and payments and a bunch of other stuff. And we got in a room and started thinking about what the marketplaces were like in the future. And here's the story of one of them I just wanted to show. You guys should hear what we have to say before you clap. <laughs> this is what happened when you put three ethnographers and one guy specializing in Shenzhai culture together and talk about human reproduction. 2025, according to UN predicted, the birth rate of current humankind is going to drop by 30%. And that trend continue. Will we go more than 50%? Why don't people have babies? Is it because of the pollution and the lifestyle of stress that quality of sperm is dramatically dropping? In 2025, healthy sperm is becoming very, very rare and population is dropping. Let's imagine sperm becomes a rare commodity. You can have 100 or even thousands of brothers and sisters because there's this only one dad who can still produce healthy sperm. So family is going to be redefined because sperm becomes an extremely rare commodity. So sperm poaching becomes a thing. There is a service or system that analyzes the sperm. So it's going to get evaluated, it's going to be sold for a price. You can actually sit at home, take the sperms you just bought of some guy from the street and do genome editing to decide what kind of babies, what kind of physical appearances, what kind of health potentials, what kind of IQ this baby you want to have can be all customized at home. All the stories that we're sharing are actually behaviors that already exist in this society. I, it's that notion of you can begin to uh, imagine what the world's going to look like, but actually building it in front of you, I think, is really important. So again, the, the learning for us is constantly, as we, as we find ourselves, this organization based in Asia but having a global view is, if you really want to learn, you have to go to the edges of where you are and be really uncomfortable about doing that. Otherwise, you're not learning enough or quick enough. And often you need to build, like we did here, the questions and the future as you go, because no one's really going to tell you what the answer is. If everybody tells you what the answer is, then, then you're kind of done. Most organizations are really good at selling. They're not very good at listening. So again, think about who's your chief meeting officer, who's listening to you. And then, as I said before, I'm much more interested in context than content. So I'm much more intrigued about how, in this new world, you can reframe the current assets and capabilities that you've got, but you think about what the world it's going into, versus trying to re change the assets and capabilities. As the, as the example showed, I'm also intrigued about what open uh, communities are versus owning. Nobody knows what the future is going to look like, so, and all the answers are usually outside of the room where you usually are, so how do you enable that to happen? Because ultimately, the network that learns fastest will win. And that's what we're trying to do. So whether the hypothesis that a billion people are wrong, but they point to this new school of consumerism, that's what we're doing. So if you want to come join us, we're often in Hong Kong and often in Shanghai and other places. And uh, our belief is that we're still in the world of diverging and creating choices. Thank you very much.